Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. My name is Natalia Moczulska and this is the news. 177 days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. For the first time since July 6th, Russia announced no territorial gains in Ukraine on Thursday. Turkish President Recep Erdogan has offered President Zelensky a meeting with Putin in Turkey. He added that Turkey will continue to contribute to solving the Ukrainian crisis through diplomacy and negotiations. For the first time since July 6th, Russia has not announced any new territorial gains in Ukraine. In Kharkiv, however, the number of victims of yesterday's Russian missile attacks increased to 21. More than 40 people are injured. Before dawn, the Russians again fired on the residential district of Kharkiv, destroying another educational institution. In turn, the building of the university was bombed in Nikolaev. The missile also fell on a school in Kramatorsk and Donbass. The Russian army is allocating huge resources to capture at least one more kilometer in the Donbass. Russian officials repeat threats against Odessa and other Ukrainian cities. We can see what is happening at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We see what happened in Olenivka. We can and should only think about winning. Win on the battlefield, on the political front, in the information confrontation, on the economic plane. The UN Secretary General at yesterday's meeting with the presidents of Ukraine and Turkey in Lviv promised to set up a team to investigate the circumstances of the tragedy in Olenivka, where Ukrainian prisoners of war were killed. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres during the Thursday meeting coordinated not only their positions but also actions on the most important issues. Nobody induced Ukraine to make concessions to the Russian Federation. I suspect that by the end of this war the resolution of many problems by diplomatic means will depend on the coordination and decisions of this trio. President Zelensky declared that Russia must immediately and unconditionally withdraw its troops from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Otherwise, there is a threat of global radioactive catastrophe. Military equipment and personnel should be withdrawn from the plant. Oops. Further deployment of forces or equipment to the site must be avoided. The area needs to be demilitarized. And we must tell it as it is. Any potential damage to Zaporizhia is suicide. Ukraine military intelligence claims to have received new information confirming that the Russian occupation forces are planning an attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Most of the specialists were not allowed to perform their professional duties today, and representatives of Rosatom have left the premises. First of all, we talked about the danger that appears around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We don't want to experience another Chernobyl. Turkey and Ukraine signed a memorandum to help rebuild Ukraine's infrastructure, including roads and bridges. Under the agreement, the first bridge is to be rebuilt on the road connecting Bucha with Irpin. But according to experts, President Erdogan is trying to achieve his political goals during the war. Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, is to have a balanced policy, uh, which perhaps can be summarized as saying uh, that Turkey would be pro-Ukraine without being anti-Russia. And the fundamental reason for that is that Turkey uh, believed that it did not have the luxury uh, to totally alienate Russia because uh, unlike other NATO countries, uh, which have different uh, areas of vulnerability, particularly energy and to some extent the economy, on top of that, uh, Turkey has a dependence on Russia in the area of uh, national security because of Syria, where Turkey needs Russia's diplomatic partnership in order to avert uh, a scenario of, the, or yet another scenario of humanitarian disaster which could potentially lead uh, to, a, uh, to new refugee flows. At the meeting in Lviv, the presidents of Ukraine and Turkey and the UN Secretary General also discussed issues related to the transport of grain. The continuation of talks happened today in Odessa. Yesterday, a restaurant owner and rapper duo unveiled Star's Coffee, reopening the chain of coffee shops in Russia formerly owned by the Starbucks Corporation. It is the latest major company rebranding after a months-long Western corporate exodus from the country. Global franchise operator Alshea, established in Kuwait, had lost interest in doing business after Starbucks pulled its brand from Russia. The deal mirrors a wider trend among Western brands, which has been changing the country's retail and corporate landscapes as the conflict in Ukraine enters its sixth month.
The American company gave its partner in Kuwait a right for a franchise in Russia, and this company was developing its coffee shops under this brand. When Starbucks decided to leave Russia, the company from Kuwait had lost interest in doing business without the brand, so they sold the right for their rental locations. We won the tender, acquired it, and made our own brand. There were a lot of participants. That is it. We just found other suppliers, found the right roasters, and because the baristas mix it all correctly, we have a product that we think will be competitive. At a packed launch in central Moscow, rapper Timati presented the new brand, whose logo features an image of a woman with a star above her head, alongside co-owner and restaurateur Anton Pinsky. Banned from using the Starbucks logo, Timati said they had sought to find some continuity, namely the circular shape and female gender, which he said contrasted nicely with the brown cigar-like masculine color in the new logo. People's perceptions may be different, but if you compare, then apart from the circle, you won't find anything in common. The common element is a circle indeed, the swan princess, Russian beauty in a traditional Russian kokoshnik. Starbucks declined to comment on the similarity of the logo and name, but referred to an earlier statement in which it said the company had made the decision to exit and no longer had a brand presence in the Russian market. Seattle-based Starbucks, which helped popularize takeaway coffee in a traditionally tea-loving society, said it would exit Russia after nearly 15 years in late May. Starbucks had 130 stores in Russia, operated by its licensed Alshea Group, with nearly 2,000 employees in the country. Pinsky said shops would gradually reopen throughout August and September. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz rejected accusations of impropriety in his handling of a multi-billion euro tax fraud. This scandal led to a situation in which the German state treasury suffered billions in losses. The chancellor emphasizes, however, that he did not know anything about the case. In the scheme of Cumex or dividend stripping, banks and investors would swiftly trade shares of companies around their dividend payout day, blurring stock ownership and allowing multiple parties to falsely reclaim tax rebates on dividends. The loophole now closed took on a political dimension due to the sluggishness of authorities under the mayorship of Schultz at demanding repayment of millions of euros gained under the scheme by local bank Warburg. Warburg, which plays a big role in Germany's second largest city, eventually paid its tax bill of around 50 million euros after the federal finance ministry intervened. During his second appearance in front of a Hamburg parliamentary committee of inquiry into the Cumex affair, one of Germany's biggest post-war corporate scandals, Schultz said he did not exert any influence on the Warburg tax case. Of course I would like him to come clean, but I honestly don't expect anything. I expect him not to remember and to refer to his former statements. I think that in the end transparency will benefit the truth here, and that in the end we will know how it went, and we believe that we already know 90% percent of that today. We can see that from the files, we can see that from the communication situation, and we can see that from the behavior after the events, because many things have been deleted here, have been concealed or attempted to be concealed. These are all things that one does not do if one has nothing to hide. Schultz has denied any knowledge of this cash or its origin and said he no longer has contact with the lawmaker involved. The lawmaker did not respond to a request for comment. The chancellor already faced Hamburg lawmakers last year and acknowledged them having a series of meetings with the then chairman of Warburg, but said he could not recall the details. Some protesters gathered in front of the parliament in Hamburg to call for Schultz to clarify his role in the case. I fear that Olaf Scholz will continue to try to hide behind gaps in his memory. That is why we are standing here and demanding transparency and clarification from him. The expectation is that he will contribute to clarification, because that would actually be the role he should take on as a politician. After all, citizens have been robbed in these transactions, and the political actors should be on the right side and provide clarification instead of obstructing it. The case threatens to undermine the chancellor, even as he is trying to hold his coalition together in the face of public discontent over soaring energy inflation. His popularity is already lagging that of his economy and foreign ministers, while just 58 percent of Germans think he is doing a good job compared to an average of around 70 percent for his predecessor Angela Merkel during her 16 years in office. 
Tekla Junievic died at the age of 116. A woman from Gliwice is the oldest Polish woman in history and the second oldest person in the world. But above all, an extraordinary woman with a great heart and strong character. She lived 116 years, two months and nine days. Mrs. Tekla Junievic passed away at the age of 116. We will all remember her as the oldest Polish woman and the second oldest person in the world. But I still remember our last meeting. An unusual woman with a big heart. Mrs. Tekla, it is an honor that I was able to meet you. Tekla Junievich was born on June 10, 1906, in the village of Krupsko, in what was then Austria-Hungary, 40 kilometers from Lviv. She was 12 when Poland regained independence and 33 when World War II began. Mrs. Tekla was very active all her life. She hated stagnation. She liked cinema, historical programs, playing cards and flowers. She gardened, read a lot, loved company and traveling. She loved her family very much, with whom she was very close to, as described on Gliwice official portal, Gliwice.eu, paying a tribute to the oldest Polish woman. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please stay tuned for Poland Daily Weather, Poland Daily Business, and some of our other programs. But for me, it's have a great weekend.